Blog Talk Radio. Om Shabbat Shalom, Holy Way of the Most High. Om Shabbat Shalom, I sense your presence. Om Shabbat Shalom, Holy Way of the Most High. Om Shabbat Shalom, I sense your presence. And I am the light within your soul In the essence of truth and right Love makes the circle whole And here we stand in line Waiting for some sacred sign But to find the balance is the purpose of this time to restore the balance of the universal mind And in the presence of my Lord of light and love Everything I see aspiring to be free And when I call to thee And come on bending knee Surrender to the all-pervading light and love Reflections of the one surrounding me with love And I sense your presence I sense your presence I sense your presence I sense your presence Within and without, above and below, yeah. East, west, north, and south, I sense your presence. Without and within, below and above, yeah, yeah. East, west, north, and south, I sense your presence. I sense your presence. Shabbat 
Activating Compassion in the Midnight Hour. My name is Jesse Ann Nichols George, and I'm your hostess this evening. The music you were just listening to at the beginning of the show is I Sense Your Presence. It's by Shemshai. And I want to extend a welcome to everybody that's joining us, whether you're joining us here for the very first time or whether you've listened to the show before and you're coming back because you like what we're offering here. We are also streaming live in three additional places Talk Stream Live. Dreamfinder and Penn, also known as Pair Encounters Network, and I welcome everyone listening through those channels, as well as those that are catching the uh, podcast through TuneIn.com, iTunes, and those catching the YouTube version of the show once it's posted. Here at Activating Compassion in the Midnight Hour, I look at different ways that compassion exists in our lives, how to remove our blocks, resistances, frustrations, and more. And some weeks I will be discussing different aspects of how compassion's in our life, how it affects our life, and the different areas of compassion. And then some weeks I am doing different exercises and practical implementations. We're going to be doing some of that next week when we talk about our show on masks and costumes. And many times I have wonderful guests on the show so that you can learn about their work and how other things complement and work with compassion and Tonight is certainly no exception to that, with Greg Doyle coming on tonight. And I will also be highlighting different musical artists along the way. Last year we had Stephen Halpern on, Peter Cater, uh, Jill Mapton's been on the show, Claire, Claire Hadeen, Bruce Ciccarelli, Craig Carollas, Harold Grandstaff Moses. So some really great people coming in through that channel as well. And then what I do is in my own work, I focus on helping people find and use compassion in their everyday lives. I've created the Genesis Clearing Statement, and if you've missed that, you can catch it in some of the archived shows, as well as some of the interviews that other people have done on me, which you can certainly find on my website, jessianennicholsgeorge, the number one dot com. I've also authored four books, the most recent being You, Me, Life, Dreams, which is based on relationships and also the companion workbook to that, and then my first two books, Activating Compassion and its companion workbook. In addition, I've created the Compassion Tour, which is a multi-state nationwide tour that includes workshops, retreats, seminars, book signings, and fundraising events. And you can certainly follow all the events to register for on the Compassion Tour um, through my website. They're listed under the events or workshop section, either way you want to look at it. And I do actually have one coming up tomorrow, so I will remind you there's just a few spots left for that if you'd like to jump in on that. Also, I have a great uh, seasonal weekend event coming up next weekend on the 1st and the 2nd, and that's going to be in Atlantic City. The one coming up tomorrow is in the Philadelphia, near Philadelphia area. Um, Is it Philadelphia or Pittsburgh? Oh, gosh, I always flip them. (laughs) It's in Pennsylvania. How's that? (laughs) And uh, so that's a great option. I do want to extend a couple of thank yous out tonight. And uh, the first thank you I want to get out tonight is to the Enlightened Path Holistic Center, who has been hosting me throughout the week here. So a special thanks to uh, definitely Lorraine there, Kat, who we had on the show actually last week. And if you missed that show, I encourage you to go back and check it out in the archives. And uh, it was just such a blessing to be, you know, in her space there in Pottstown. Really, really a nice, beautiful, energetic space there. And then uh, also I'd like to send out a thank you to Lorraine Cohen, who we may have coming on in upcoming shows, actually. So we'll have to see when we get her scheduled in, perhaps. Um, She's allowing me some space to work from tonight, which is beautifully, wonderfully uh, quiet, so I appreciate that as well. And and if you'd like to check out uh, either of those two people, first of all, the Enlightened Path Holistic Center, you can check them out at enlightenedpath-hc.com. And uh, and Lorraine, like I said, check out her work. She's doing some very interesting work in uh, healing the heart and... uh, various work there, and her website is LorraineCohen.com. So uh, definitely a great amount of appreciation for both of them there. 
Now, just a reminder, if you enjoy the show this evening, make certain that you tell your friends, family, significant others, you know, all those great connections you have out there in the social media world and other people who maybe have an interest. You just never know who's life you're going to touch along the way, and I know when I share things, there's always somebody that comes back and goes, I was just having a conversation about that, or I've always wanted to know about that type of an experience, and I think this is definitely going to be one of those shows, because there's a lot of people who are really interested in astral traveling or those out-of-body experiences, and and this is a great opportunity. This show, Greg, is, is really a uh, an expert on some of this, and he's got a wealth of information in this area, so it will definitely be one you want to share with other people. And they can just use the same link that you use to get into the live show. They can use that to listen to the archives at their convenience, and they can also catch it on my um, website on my page of the Main Street Universe tab on my website, and I have all the archive shows there so they can go and and get that, as well as, again, uh, podcast versions at iTunes, TuneIn.com, as well as on my YouTube channel. So lots of options depending on what somebody's preference is. Now, before we get started on everything, um, what I like to do is I like to open up to a little book by Yehuda Berg, which I absolutely love. It's called The 72 Names of God. And, you know, those that have listened, they know the reason that I like Yehuda's work is because he takes the big, giant concepts that we sometimes struggle with or feel overwhelming to us, and then he gets them into this everyday language. And that's, that's kind of the way I function. That's the way I work is big concepts, but let's put them into everyday life where we can actually implement them. So the message that we have coming from Yehuda tonight is uh, the common word of God that he uses here is forget thyself. And the little uh, start-off point with this is, We constantly get in our own way. We think we're smart, clever, and able to solve our problems on our own without any help from above. And this name nudges us aside, allowing the light to come in and do the job. Now, the insight he gives on this is, the tree of life refers to the upper world that exists beyond our five senses, an endless dimension filled with light and divine energy. The tree of life is a realm of utter perfection. When we are healed from an illness, the light of healing flows from this realm. When we are financially successful, the force of prosperity derives from this dimension. When a life is created, the life force that sustains all living creatures issues from this idyllic reality. But there's a caveat. The tree of life will extend a branch down into this world only if there is an intense desire to cling to its branches. Deep yearning summons forth the tree of life. One thing stops us from doing so, ego. We are our own worst enemies. We allow our egos to get in the way of our success. We cling to our own opinions. The more people oppose us, the more entrenched we become in our own ideas. It pains us terribly to let go of long-held views. It's human nature to expend whatever energy is required to prove a point, no matter the cost. As a result, we're seduced into making decisions that gratify the ego but injure the common good. We often reject the ideas of others because they didn't originate in our own clever little minds. We may even secretly wish for failure, even if we ourselves are damaged by it. If a plan originates from someone who ignored our advice. And the meditation he gives on this is, you are now transcending the limits of yourself so that you cling to the tree of life. Happiness finds you now that the ego is out of the spotlight. You master the art of getting out of your own way, letting go of all stubbornness. Again, the common name is forget thyself, and the more traditional name, if you want to say that, is Lamed Hachet. And that is uh, up on my page of the Main Street Universe tab on my website, so you can always go back and reflect on it and, you know, check it out during the week and see what's happening there and and see what's going on. So, um, you know, that's that's really a great option to check out there. 
Now, a little thought here before we go off on break today, and this just kind of gets us prepped up for our topic today. Have you ever wanted to be unrestricted by your body? Have you ever wanted to float around the universe? And have you ever had an out-of-body experience? The concepts of parallel planes, other universes, and traveling without your body can be exhilarating, scary, and something that just doesn't come up in our everyday conversations. There are many different thoughts about whether this is safe, okay, dangerous, and so on. For me, it has just been a natural way of life. Almost as soon as I lay down, off I go. Others will also question whether astral traveling is really happening or if this is just another aspect of lucid dreaming. Either way, this experience creates very real sensations. The visuals that we receive from any state of consciousness will become a part of our mind and thoughts. It is a really interesting phenomenon and one that Greg Doyle decided to delve into fairly extensively. He now helps those with the desire to understand more about what happens during the astral travel experience. I think that this is as important as, you know, so many can easily get scared the first time they do it. And I have even had some clients say they weren't certain if they were still alive or not when it happened. To me, there seem to be even several dimensions to this experience. And some of mine have been delving into parallel planes, some connecting with those that have passed beyond, and some that have been experiencing my future self. My most recent and currently in-progress tour has actually been basically one big deja vu experience due to this. I had the dreams, I got out there, and I'm living them. (laughs) And it's an interesting experience to see. Be interesting to see what Greg has to say on that as well. I have found that I don't have to, don't tend to have problems, I should say, when I journey out there. Um, I always tell myself that I have complete control of all things I encounter. And I also like to surround myself with a circle of white light prior to falling asleep, an old tradition that one of my mentors shared with me. And for me, it's, this wonder, it's just like a big, giant, wonderful playground out there. It's an opportunity for incredible experiences to happen and the ability to help myself and others in other realms. What are your experiences with astral traveling? How did you feel getting out of your body? Do you accept these experiences or write them off as crazy dreams? This week, our guest is focusing on a component of compassion that's related to the aspect in my books of waking up. And this reminds us that when we build our awareness, we also build our compassion from the experiences that we gain during the process. I'm going to be taking a short break here, and when we return, I will have Greg Doyle with us, and he will be sharing his work with us in astral traveling. The song that I have for you during our break tonight is called Corridors of My Mind. It's by Claire Hedin, and if you'd like to find out more about her work, you can certainly do so. You can connect with her music at www.clairehedin.com, and that's C-L-A-R-E. H-E-D-I-N dot com. We'll be back in just a couple of minutes. Make sense 
www.clairehedin.com That's C-L-A-R-E-H-E-D-I-N.com And I'd like to bring on my guest tonight, Greg Doyle. He is a Reiki master, energy healer, Reiki channel, and holds expertise in mind-body-spirit connection, particularly in energy healing, meditation, and out-of-body experiences such as astral travel and astral projection. He helps people to move forward through their pain and obstacles and connect more fully with their joy and potential. Greg is a trained classical musician, which helped him to discover meditation in his early 20s to combat stress of stage fright and recognizing the greater aspect of self in the process. He believes that astral travel is a valuable tool for this spiritual expansion, and Greg is the author also of Awakening the Giant Within, A Personal Adventure into the Astral Realms. And we're looking tonight at his work in astral traveling and astral projection, and you can certainly learn more about his work and the work that he's doing at www.gregdoylereike.com. So that's G-R-E-G-D-O-Y-L-E-R-E-I-K-I.com. And... Greg, I want to welcome you here to Activating Compassion in the Midnight Hour. Hi, Jesse. Can you hear me? How are you? I'm doing well, and we can we can hear you well. So thank you. Oh, great. I, I appreciate thank it. You. And I, it's great. Greg, it's great to be on the show, and and thanks for having me. Oh, it's it's a pleasure to have you on the show, and I know you're in a whole different time zone, so it's already tomorrow. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <for you. laughs> Exactly. Which, which is awesome. I love that about the internet that we can we can connect that way and bring you in and and open it up. And um, but you you have an amazing amount of work and you connected with me. It was actually about a year ago when I had somebody else on that was doing astrology and dream work and various things like that. And mm-hmm. then That's I actually it. had the pleasure of jumping into a call kind of teleseminar thing that you were doing with you and it was such an honor to work with you at that time and the same jesse it, w- it was great to connect with you and and to to hear everything you're doing it's, it's wonderful I, I would love for you to start off sharing with our listeners greg a bit about 
you know, who who is Greg and how did you get into it? I got some of the technical description down, but, mm. you know, how did you really get into this work? Put some of those pieces together for us, if you will. Yes, well, well, look, it is an interesting story. I had never really heard of astral travel before. It wasn't on my on my radar at all. And um, I was working as a musician in Vienna, and and then all of a sudden, um, one evening, this is the best way I can describe it. A light came in and and took me from my body while I was sleeping. It was just before dawn, down a tunnel, to uh, what seemed to be an alien world. Now this sounds, this can sound quite peculiar to someone hearing it for the first time. And for me at the time, it was an absolute shock, because I was woken from my sleep by this by a, by a light, as I said, which is not a, a normal everyday kind of occurrence. I had no idea what was happening, and the thing was, it 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 took me to a, to a place that seemed very very real, or even more real than this earth if you like my senses were heightened and everything like this this was to go on for, for for quite a time i was having experiences after that where i was often taken out of my body there was a feeling of um being invited out of my body if you like uh, and also um the aspect of my consciousness being fully awakened from my sleeping state so i knew exactly that i was in bed that it was maybe just before dawn i had full um, human kind of recollection or my, my full memory. Um, this was a very odd occurrence. So that was how it all started. Yeah, it, it, it's interesting, and I think that that experience does happen for people when they're when they're starting off. That maybe oftentimes um, they they get out of body unexpectedly. Mm-hmm. Um, one way or another, and I—I I mean, was that a scary thing for you? I mean, it, I definitely yeah. it took you by surprise, but it did. It did. The first time it happened, it was interesting. The, the energy that came in—it um, seemed to come to my forehead. It was a light, and and, and it, it collected all this other energy within my forehead, if you like. I could feel like it was sort of like triangle slithers of energy all coming to the center into a huge whooshing tunnel, and then there was—it was—it was far more dramatic than I even just told it to you then, there was a lot of wind in my ears, there was a lot of wind going on. And But the, this energy also came into my heart, and my heart, at that stage I wasn't, um, like the vocabulary of heart chakras and guides and all these things, this was non-existent. I wasn't on a spiritual path, per se, not that I knew. But this energy came into my heart and made me feel very good. So it was a feeling, it was a really um, heightened state um, and that wasn't scary, but then the problem was the next night, the light came again. As soon as I lay down and closed my eyes, the light came again, and this was a bit of a shock. I wasn't prepared for it to happen like this. As soon as I opened my eyes, the light was gone. I closed my eyes, the light was back. So I, did, I chose not to go with it the second night um, because I was too shocked by what was going on. That I could be there really, and it really was the feeling of, of of being taken of my out of my body. Like the very first experience, I, I was I was going down this hose, it could only be described as like a wormhole, and it was, I was thinking, wow, I I, I have no body, <laughs> and it was, but my my I was absolutely razor sharp in in my in my mind as I went down this place. So, and at the end of that that first experience, also. I was taken to a, a world that I felt wasn't earthly. It was a very arid landscape, very tall buildings with kind of saucer-shaped tops to them. There were lots of lights on and lights off. And it was very modern technology, a feeling of extraterrestrial species, planet. It was, And it was very, very, as I said, very, very real. And I knew in that moment. And these are many of the things I learned in the astral. Is It's actually not actually spoken. I knew that there are others. Um, and that this is real. Even though these are not questions I was asking, I was not interested in UFOs or extraterrestrial um, beings. I, I wasn't interested in that. So to get back to your original question, the first time it wasn't scary, it was just amazing, and then the next night it was scary. <laughs> because I felt not in control. I felt, what is happening here? Um, soon after that, what would happen is energies would come 
once again before dawn it was like a vibration just outside of my body if you like and it would I would feel this vibration now I say it in a gently in a gentle way a vibration but at the time it was a, it was a shuddering vibration really it was like a, it was like a a close range helicopter <laughs> Um, and this vibration would seem to, um, if you like, wake me up, wake up my consciousness. And then I really did have a choice whether I want to go with it or not. And I, then I could feel something within my body vibrating as well. Uh, it seemed to center around the heart chakra. And uh, that seems to be the primary energy driver in my experience. And then I would uh, be take I had the feeling of being lifted out of my body and... Um, and that was how the whole process began. I began to not fear it um, and to enjoy this because I was often shown things, uh, past lives. Uh, like one, one tremendous early experience was I was lifted out of my body and I'd often be in a, a kind of a void, like a black void, where I'm just sort of suspended there. And I heard my own voice resonate as if from around me or above me. or, But it was my own voice, but from somehow... Thinking about it was almost like my, my own voice from a higher realized self. And I heard my voice say, I want to see me. And then the next thing, I see myself in front of me, exactly as I am. This was 15 years ago when it started, so I was 15 years younger. <laughs> but exactly <laughs> as I was at that time, um, in front of me, really perfect, um, ultra high definition, if you like, 3D, 4D, <laughs> because your, your senses are much heightened. You know, there are more colors, and it's hard to explain that. But I see myself, and then there's a wind in the ears again, and like with the first astral experience, and then there's like a slideshow, and I get younger and younger and younger, and I become a baby, um, and then I'm gone, and, and my eyes are always in the same place. Then next, there's an old Chinese Mongolian man. Now, once again, I just knew he was Chi Chinese Mongolian. No one said, Greg, he's Chinese Mongolian, but I knew it. Um, <laughs> and it's the same thing. He's an old man. He gets uh, a slideshow of him getting younger and younger and younger and younger. It becomes a child, a baby, gone. And the whole time my eyes are staying in the same place exactly. The next one is a, um, a Native African. He's, he, it's quite scary. He's got full um, body paint and he looks like a, a medicine man. Uh, he's, he's in his 30s, say, and, and the same kind of thing. I'm thinking to myself, don't, 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 don't get scared. Don't run away. This is okay. I'm being shown something. <laughs> You know, because it's right in front of you. It's just as real as the computer I'm speaking into right now is in front of me. <laughs> anyway, um, anyway, uh, so he gets also younger, younger, younger. Then the next one really got me. I'm thinking, okay, this is interesting. Um, the next one is not uh, not human, and uh, he has a, a very longish head, very unusual um, looking body, and the eyes in the same place, and also in the background is once again not earth so there's this theme again of not earth and, and at, at this stage i choose to come back and um in your introduction you were talking a little bit about the fears we have doing this and at this at this stage it was still pretty early and and um you know when i saw this alien um which does have negative connotation in society so better to say extraterrestrial perhaps but this this non earthly being, I I got the shock of my life, and I, I and as I pulled out of the astral, so you can you know I know I'm lying back in bed. Um, that's what people have to understand. You 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 know you know what's happening here, and as I pulled back, I heard a voice say intermission, and, and that was quite funny. There was kind of, a kind of a humour and a guidance going on, and I did learn to I, I have met um, guides in these astral realms, but. What was interesting was that um, at that stage, the idea of a past life regression also wasn't on my radar. I didn't, I hadn't given thought to past lives. I was brought up a Catholic, um, not really a committed Catholic. I think by the age of twelve or so, we weren't going to church so much. But, but it was, I hadn't thought of past lives. And, and then, and then the penny dropped. Not long, not long after, I, I knew someone who um, ran a meditation circle, and she said, Greg. I think you experienced a past life regression. And as she said that, I, I felt this kind of, this wave of energy surge in my body. And often astral knowing or astral learning seems to happen like that. The penny drops just at the right time or someone says something and it makes sense. 
And so then I entertained the idea that, in fact, I, I, I was much more than, than, than who I thought I was. And, um, and this was just the beginning of this, uh, this incredible experience of, um, of, of really a form of, of spiritual awakening, uh, of, of learning what I am as an energy, you know? You know, you bring up some good points. And, you know, I, I think I've heard your story before when I worked with you last mm-hmm. year um, with all the different beings visiting you. And and it always reminds me of the the movie A, A Christmas Carol, <laughs> where the okay, yeah, yeah, different yeah. ones keep coming and visiting the the poor guy <laughs> trying to that's, to change him over. And uh, <laughs> he went on with his life exactly. Yeah, it's like I mean that's probably what would have been going through my mind at this that time. Like, really, am I that bad? <laughs> but um, yeah, well, well, it was just a feeling. I had no idea what was going on. I was I was so. Um, amazed at the time and shocked and and w- with with the, the actual experience of being shown things in hyper real definition with a with a with a very clear mind and uh, the, just the logistics of the whole thing the fact that this could happen physically uh, it took a while almost for these messages or, or, or these things to to kind of integrate into my into my sort of spiritual framework of of the world it was more i was just thinking wow 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 also after each of these experiences i was having these strange tears i wake up in these like tears of ecstatic joy and um and i wasn't um as i said before looking for any kind of i wasn't on any kind of spiritual path so it was a feeling a little bit of being at this early stage of being kind of hijacked as you say like that the Christmas story was like, what, what? <laughs> Do I need to know this? But it was still, I knew something big was going on. I knew that there was something major moving within me, you know? Mm-hmm. Yes, and, you know, I really like that you brought up the point about realizing that you were more than who you thought you were. And mm-hmm. I have been astral traveling all of my life. I mean, as long as I can remember, I I go back, I remember it, three astral traveling. Um, And for me, it was just a natural process, but it it really does connect you with that aspect and that concept. And I, I think that that experience really does help give you a sort of expanded aspect and version in the sense of, Yes, there is something more out there. There is something beyond this body. And when you get these experiences, it really does register in that strong way where it, where it really does hit home. I would love for you to kind of give a framework of reference of maybe some sort of a definition, if you will, on astral traveling an astral projection, and is there? How do they differ? I, I mean, I've seen both terms used. Yeah, it's it's a good question. I think, really, you know, it, it is a projection. It's kind of the same. I mean, often I use the word astral travel because people they seem to have heard that before. Um, if if I give a definition, this is what I feel is happening: that we we are essentially vibratory resonators our body you know so and now i'm far more conscious of that like um i'm i'm always within myself i can even now i can feel how my toes are feeling that the buzz of energy through me so this whole process has made me has made me very aware of this movement of energy through me i don't i don't see myself as kind of dense physically as before the the astral body is really um, what's happening during this split, if you like, is that a part of a, an aspect of the physical body is able to vibrate at a higher vibration. So essentially, the physical body is a denser vibration than the astral body. Um, when the astral, for me, when the astral split occurs, it's generally the heart chakra is very is, is pounding quite quickly. And many people have said, well, uh, could you have a heart attack? It's dangerous. I said, no, not really, because I've often come straight back into my body after it, and it's not bending quickly at all. So 
It's the actual energy of the heart or the, the astral body's heart that is vibrating uh, very powerfully to get it moving. Now, the, if you think of it, the, the heart is the fourth chakra and the astral body is seen as the, the fourth body. Um, so it correlates with that, with that, with that chakra. Also, um, even the, the very word astral comes from the Latin word astrum, which means star. So your astral body is your star body. The, the ancients knew this in their wisdoms. And if you look at even that Tibetan Buddhism, they, 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 they teach this to their monks. Now, getting back to the definition, as you said, it's a very real thing. Um, you are actually vibrating in a, at, a, at, a, at a higher revolution or a higher, higher vibration and therefore your reality around you alters. So how I see it is that right now, um, within our bodies, we are vibrating at all different frequencies, experiencing different, slightly different way, different aspects of the universe all at the same time. So this is just, if you like, I'm tapping into that, as you, as you have been too, or anyone who's astral traveling. So, and then we, we integrate, when we come back into our physical body, we integrate these memories. So whether we're not traveling actually somewhere or just projecting, it's kind of the same. I feel this definite pull out of my body. And, and often when I travel in this dimension, as in um, traveling like a ghost in this dimension, if you like, uh, which is which is more difficult to do because you have to try to stay conscious while you fall asleep, which can you can lie there for hours doing certain exercises. So there, it's 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 clearer because you look back and you can see your body, you can feel the pull, you can even um, analyze your state. Um, also, what I've noticed is that each time I'm in this state, I often look at my own mental state when I'm in the astral and and. The, the most enlightening thing about the whole process is the lack, the tremendous lack of fear or lack of death, and these kind of things that are that are very easy to to say, as I'm saying now, are incredibly strong in the visceral sense when you're in the astral because you really really feel it. It's just you know that you're not going to die and it, that you cannot die. That this energy that is within you is is just so much more connected, and you have this feeling of perfection. All this, and then. So each time you come back to your physical being, you really feel that. In the very beginning, I, I actually found it very difficult to get around because this was happening a lot. I didn't want to be in my physical body. I felt it was something separate. I wanted to be up there the whole time. Um, and I was just get, I just couldn't wait to get home, sort of meditate and get out. And, um, but little by little, I started to realize that um, this kind of astral energy, if you like, or this knowledge was kind of... Um, it's hard to say, but I could I could sense the astral space around me even in this reality, um, and I started to bring back these realizations. Uh, perhaps not even consciously, it just happened. But you start to bring back the feeling that okay, there is no fear. In fact, there's nothing to fear, and you start to realize that you're a perfect being, and your self acceptance and self love, and then that really is the key to it all, isn't it? Once you once you let yourself off the hook for anything that has happened, then you realize that everything that has happened in your life is it should have happened that way anyway. So it's a sense of guidance. And, and the whole thing is like looking from a mirror back into another mirror, and back again and back again and back again and back again. <laughs> it sort of multiplies and multiplies and multiplies. So I, I really do, for, for those people to say, oh, well, you know, you could be dreaming and having a very real dream. I understand that. And if someone were to tell me, oh, you know, um, if, if I had never astral traveled and, and, and someone were to talk about it, I probably wouldn't deep down believe what, what, what they were trying to get across. But because it's just so, so real, you then start to see this reality as a kind of illusion, not in a negative way, but you see it as purely as a space to be authentic and to... Don't you find that yourself, Jesse, that it's just purely... And then everything works. Everything wraps around itself. Your life will, will manifest in exactly the way it should for you without the need to steer it. It's, it's kind of like a surrender, isn't it? Because you, you know that deep down everything is, is working in, in perfection. Um, I've gone way beyond your question there. I hope I didn't answer <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> we'll we have point. time. Um, <laughs> I want to wrap back around to a couple of points here, and I want to reinforce yep. that yep. you mentioned 
the fast pounding in the heart chakra, and that is yep. in the chakra and in the energy center, yep. not the heart itself. So there's a. Exactly. I, I want to make sure that that's clear for people. So it's not like you're going to have a heart attack or something like that. No, this no, is no. in the energy center, and that fast pounding in the energy center is like getting an adrenaline rush, for example. Yeah, yeah it is. It is very much so. Uh, but it's focused in that center, and and I love that you describe it as being, you know, with your star body or or your, you know, that it's. You know, mm. this movement of your star body. I think that mm. that's a really accurate description. Um, and I'm going to come back to something else <laughs> here. And the the awareness of the lack of death, I found that piece interesting that you said because I've never feared death and I've been astral traveling all my life. So yeah. interesting. interesting. I, there could be a very interesting correlation because in doing the astral traveling, you make the separation, so it's really like you're getting that experience of what it's like to die, in Absolutely. a sense that your physical body is still alive, but yeah. that separation is the same thing that happens when your physical body does give out. And mm -hmm. it would be interesting to know if other people who have astral traveled also feel that way where they don't fear death anymore because they know what's going to happen. They know what it's going to yeah. be like anyways. Um, yeah, I think I, th I think you're absolutely right. I think that, that is what it is. Uh, it's sort of like, um, it's almost like an eroding process, isn't it? It's like a wave coming into a rock, and over time it just totally erodes that whole concept and, and the fear of, of, of annihilation, if you like. And I tend to think that when I look at, at human conscious or mortal conscious, mortal consciousness, I think that the, the average human being is carrying around this constant fear of kind of annihilation, whether it be, or death, whether it be of their body, of their loved ones, of their job, of the life as they know it now. And it's this constant um, clenching, if you like. Um, mm -hmm. And once you, once you rid yourself of that, I think that's, that is one of the primary um, energies to, to, to really rid. And this is, I'm glad you, 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 you bring light on this subject because I think this is the the crux of of the of the of of what of, of as a tool what our still travel really brings to, to to us is it just this release of the fear of death is phenomenal. I even had one experience once again quite early on where I'm where I'm out of my body and I hear my voice say I hear my voice ask the question because often with our still traveling as you know you're able to I can work out like a trip where I want to go beforehand but often I, I just let it happen. Often I let it happen. One time I was taken out of my body. And I thought, great, it's happening. The vibration's calm and I'm out. Then I heard my, my own voice say, I want to see my death. And then I was on a room. I, I'll remember the room. And it was interesting. Whether or not I, I'm just you know, experiencing a mortal death or whether this will be my future death, I'm not sure. But it, I was, I, I'll never forget the room I was lying in. But the, the interesting thing was I was lying there and I couldn't move. I thought, what's this? And then I noticed all this blood next to my head. And it might sound rather gruesome to people, but it's more the effect of the tool of this. And I was, I was draining my own blood. I was trying to reach up to this uh, bed spread that was next to me. I was lying on the ground next to a bed. And um, I, I, I couldn't move my body and I could feel the blood gurgling. And I, and I thought, just let go, let go. Let go, it's okay, let go. And I was in full panic, kind of panic. I knew that it was an astral thing because I was dying. But then as soon as I came out of it, once again, my heart, I was totally calm. And it was, it, I chose, I could, have, I could have come out of that experience at any stage. I chose to experience that feeling of death. And uh, it was a fascinating thing. And, and once again, it, it, it kind of, yeah, it, it, it melded in towards just saying this whole, even without that, this whole astral experience, just little by little, you start to, to really recognize that, you, you know, we, we have everything coming through us uh, at all times. You know, connection to the source is actually always there. It never goes away. So it affects your state of mind incredibly once you come to terms with it and, and, and learn to kind of, um, yeah, really, you really enjoy life a lot more, even though you kind of look forward to 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 the, the end of this life, I actually look forward to my life a lot more, if you know what I mean. 
I I do definitely know what you mean, and and I wanted to address also for a moment the lucid dream versus the astral travel. And yeah. like you, to me, I know exactly when I'm lucid dreaming right. versus when I'm astral traveling. Uh, yeah. There is a definite difference for me. Uh, I everything is just as if I'm living it. Um, yes. When I'm astral traveling. When I'm lucid dreaming, things are very realistic and they're very clear and they're very um, real appearing, but there's still aspects that don't quite fit in with reality, so either. to say. Exactly. They don't, you know, they no. wouldn't be possible in my actual life, per se. Uh, there's little tidbits like that that oftentimes will tell me whether I'm in one space or the other. But I, you know, I do a lot of work in helping people de- with detachment, you know, getting detached. Um, mm-hmm. And and that doesn't, I, that's a whole other show, so I won't go into too much explanation <laughs> there. But, you know, one of the things that, that you mentioned is this attachment to the body that we have because so many people are afraid of, of dying. And, and what's interesting in that terminology to me is we're attaching to something that is not going to last and which is dying. Yeah. And why yeah. would we attach to that? Because, it, you know, on a logical level, that when, at least when you look at it in that perspective, it makes no sense. But when people do, they're attaching to dying. And I think when you're attached to dying, just like anything that you're attached to, that's going to create a certain level of fears that you're living yeah. in. So you're living in fear, and then they wonder why they can't manifest things, and they wonder why this isn't working and that's not working. And this is an underlying attachment that most people don't even realize that they have. But when you become unattached to the body, as you have, as I have, um, you know, now you're attaching to life. You're attaching to what's eternal. Yes, yes, and yes, yes, absolutely. That's huge mm-hmm. in the spiritual process. It, it really is, and as you say, you're setting yourself up for a fall if you if you are attached totally to the physical. It's it's like, but don't you find you have a greater respect for your body? Like it's amazing. I, I feel, um, you know, like a, a lovely library book I've got on loan. <laughs> I've got the, I've got the <laughs> body on loan. <laughs> it's a loan, <laughs> and also like I mean, I look after I look after my body so that. So that I can enjoy these astral experiences as well, uh, you know. It's and as you say, you kind of detach so much from it that everything that is outside of you, like everything that I'm seeing now or uh, everything I'm, uh, I'm talking to you now, th- this is is my life now, not not my body. That's not me. Everything kind of outside of me, or everything I'm experiencing is me. And by the same token. It's kind of like um, the great kind of paradox. Everything that I'm experiencing is me, and therefore that is all within me as well. So it's kind of like you become invisible as a physical being. It, this is the feeling a little bit. It's sort of don't don't you find that it's 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 a fascinating. You feel very light, um, actually physically. It's it's an unusual phenomenon, but really this this attachment. Is is an important? I know. I know what you're saying. It is, um, or detaching, is um, is a program in itself. But I found that the astral experiences made me far less reactive to everything, not just to death. I think this death is the underlying tension or or anxiety that people carry with them, or death of every situation almost, because everything is always moving. But particularly death of their their mortal bodies. But um, this lack of reaction I find to external situations, like um, for instance. Um, I've been in, oh, I, I, I was once, and as you know, it's an honor if you're in that situation, if you're in the room when, when with somebody when they're passing away, and it's fascinating on a level to experience that because you sort of feel the wave of fear before they die, and then when they die, it's a very light feeling um, and very and very beautiful. And I remember feeling that once when, when I was in a room when someone... Um, a close passed away and it was a, a real feeling of honor at being in the room when they left and this also was and this incredible feeling of joy at the actual time of passing i thought wow this is absolutely so amazing 
Um, also, what what started to to happen in me was, you know those, you know often in those discount um, Asian discount stores, you get those little fat little Buddhas, you know, that are laughing, they're they're sort of holding a bowl right. and laughing. One of those kind of derobed himself to be in my tummy. I know it sounds really weird. So often people will say, oh, it's just terrible. What's happening to me? Oh, oh, and they tell me about their suicide attempts and I find myself just laughing. It was really weird. I had a, and, and it was this feeling of this being and as I said, it was like, what are these fat little Buddhas? That's all I can explain. And he's laughing and, and absolutely irreverently at all the wrong times. Whenever anything should be really dramatic, he's just giggling and giggling and giggling and I'm trying to hold a straight face, sweating, thinking I'm supposed to be saying things like, oh, that's just terrible. That's just terrible, you know. And I just couldn't get away with it. I just, I just, I couldn't do it. I had to be authentic, and I found myself this terrible, this terrible to the person listening. I tell you that this stomach sort of this 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 real giggle, you know, going into a real uh, tummy 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 laugh. And and then it was really funny because the person was relating their attempted suicide attempt all started to look at me and then started to laugh themselves. And we both were just sat there laughing. Um, and it was this idea of the, the ridiculousness of of death or even not to be condescending because I understand that the human saga is a complex one but even that suffering itself is not actually existent and that we're, we're, we're not actually once we get low once we once we uh, let go of suffering or the need to suffer um, this is also tied in with this 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 attachment to the to the human form and this Kind of um, um, a limited existence, but when, once you get let go of that, then the whole idea of suffering is also non-existent. I remember very early on in my astral experiences, I was meditating and had a very clear female voice: "There is only joy," and it just really stuck with me. I remember at the time thinking, "Oh, what well, a lot of rubbish! There's not joy. There's so much suffering in the world. There's starvation. There's war. What do you mean there's only joy? What do you mean there's only joy? How dare you tell me there's only joy?" But I knew. I knew at that stage that this was something that I had to find out for myself, and that I and and I also knew that this was true. And um, so many of these astral experiences you have, um, you you just you really it's this touch this touch with this just this truth and, you, and it's a sense of knowing. You just it's not so much believing or wanting to believe, you just know it. And this is the the, the incredible. Um, you know, lever that astral travel gives you. Okay, you're doing to me what I usually do to people who interview me. <laughs> and oh, then no, you're giving me like about ten pieces of information to grab hold of oh, <laughs> every That's time you talk. Um, uh. So, you know, I think that um, you know, like you say, it definitely brings a greater appreciation of life, and that oftentimes mm. what happens when we become detached it's not that we're not connected it's just that we're yeah. detached from outcomes and things like that yeah. uh, and i love the image of the buddha in the belly and yeah. I, that is that's such a great image to to look at because i find that that has been the case i mean most of my life not all of it but most of it uh and particularly when i was very was very active and now I am because I just lay down and I take off um, yeah. into the universe. I I find that I do have this great appreciation for life. I do find that um, I'm able to enjoy things much more a lot of times on Earth as mm. long as I'm doing that um, mm. with that. And I, I look at it and when you're doing some of this astral travel uh, experiences what I really find it's, it's kind of like you realize that this incarnation is like one country on the face of this earth it's just one piece of what there is and there's so much more out there and, and when we astral travel we start to realize that you know this incarnation is just one piece of what we are and so like you say that once you realize that you realize well I can really appreciate this because I'm not stuck here and I think that sometimes people that look at that suicide factor feel like they're stuck on earth and I have to wonder with the way you work with it and the way you describe it if 
possibly it would be an option for people that are in that space because so much of the time they're needing that connection with their whole self as opposed to feeling locked into just the human self. And, you know, that possibly in being able to do that on a conscious level, because as you've experienced and I've experienced, it does bring on appreciation for life, that that wouldn't be a great tool for at least some of those people. <laughs> yeah, and yeah that's, 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 actually, that's actually a really good point. Um, I think, and even looking back, um, I remember as a child, I, I lucidly dreamed uh, quite a bit. Um, and as you, as you say, there's a big difference. Um, but that is a very good point. Looking back at when the astral experiences occurred, I, if I look back into really how I was thinking, I was feeling a little bit, probably a little bit of a lack of magic in the world. I know, I know it sounds a really funny thing, and even when I look further back from that, I remember when my, as every child experiences, when my mother told me um, at a certain age, you know, I think I was 10 or something, when she said, oh, by the way, there is no Santa Claus, uh, and there is no tooth fairy, and uh, I don't know if you have a tooth fairy, but and there is no Easter rabbit, Easter bunny. Uh, you know, it was the triple bunga. And I remember thinking, hang on, this this can't be true. I know that there's magic. And uh, then living my life as I did, and everything was fine, whatever, but I felt that uh, the astral experience did change the direction of my life, absolutely, even professionally. Um, you know, I... Uh, I felt that I became more authentic after it. But I, looking back, the astral experience was kind of like a retrieval or a finding again of that magic that I knew was there. It was like, oh, wow, we are much more than we are. And people could say, oh, well, you were looking for that. Well, no, I wasn't really looking for that. I didn't know it until it came along. Um, and um, maybe on a certain level, we're all looking for that. And as you say, people who are who are in a situation of being suicidal, they they are all they must be looking for something. Otherwise, they they they, they wouldn't feel the way they are. And I think that's a that's a great that's a great idea. I think with guidance, it could be a really great um, tool in 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 this self recognition and you know of the greater self. And um, this the feeling of being stuck must be terrible. I mean, I'm I'm so impressed that the average person can go through life the way they do without having these experiences. I'm actually really impressed because <laughs> I, I really am. I, I don't, when people say, oh, you know, and, and, and they're, 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 they're in absolute disbelief that it's on another planet when I talk about this. So, you know, as you know, it's, you've got to choose your audience. But um, more and more, more people are actually opening. I found this from, from writing the book that it was an amazing experience to sort of come out, if you like, with these experiences and share it. But um, I'm just so impressed that the average person gets by Without this, but as I say to them, well, you wake up in the morning. You, you know, some people aren't particularly happy in their job or whatever their life circumstances. But I see them; they wake up with a bounce. And I think, well, you're waking up with that bounce. You you must have been somewhere when you slept. You must have, you must be even without knowing it, experiencing something greater than who you are. Because look at all the smiles on everyone's faces. You know, there people are subconsciously people. People know. People know that they're much more. But to 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 make it conscious is really that that's really the um the big shift because then the reactivity um, subsides and you can you learn to surrender and to um you accept change. I think that's the greatest thing, isn't it? You know, like every situation is going to die. Everything is going to move on, and you just accept and, and embrace and you actually enjoy the change. <laughs> this is right. the thing. You know, and that that is that is really it. But uh, you, you're so right. We're using it as a tool for people who are, are not in a good place like that. Yeah, it just seems like it could be a powerful thing. And you know, with the variety of teens, and I've worked in troubled teen facilities in the past, and things, and and it seems like it could just be such a good tool for a lot of them. Um, but like you say, it's you know, it's bringing that to the consciousness is where you really tend to take the turning point and mm. and I highly agree with that tremendously and you brought up an aspect of it leads you to live more authentically and some people might think well how do you do that when you're out there in this other world but I have to say through my own experiences particularly since I've gone to being on the road full time now and 
it's been very interesting because I had all of these journeys and travels where I saw all of these things happening, and then each place I've gone, each step I've taken along the way since I've been on the road, I had already experienced it Mm. because of astral traveling and Mm. projecting out into the future. And and it has been really good because I think in a lot of ways, even though it's been this deja vu experience, it's put me at peace. It's almost like, okay, I know I'm on track. When something clicks in and all of a sudden, you know, for example, I look in the the chat room and I see the names that are in there right now, and I go, yep, already been here. I know I'm exactly on track, exactly where I'm supposed to be. And it's when things have maybe hit a couple of interesting points, like some really crazy rainstorms that I hit a couple of places, and I thought, nope, already had this experience. I know... It's like I could just go right into peace as opposed to going, oh, my God, do I need to worry about this or worry about that or be concerned? And it's like, nope, I know it's all okay. And Mm. it's allowing me to approach life in this even more authentic way than where I was. Um, I feel as a result of it. You're so right. You're so right. It's such a good way of putting it. I, I sometimes feel as though we're, we're like on the end of a string and we're being pulled along. And whereas before I saw that as, oh, who, you know, who's taking me through this? I realized that it's like you're taking yourself through it. And it's, it's, it's hard to explain, but like the string has been there before and it's pulling you along. So you're sort of experiencing everything. You're following the string, if you like, knowing the consciousness of the string. Um and all the memories and everything, and, and it does allow you to really let go. You just know that everything is, everything kind of has been. It's almost like uh, if we see time as, as as like um, a rod or like a telescope. You know, on, on the table in front of you is a telescope, and then you then you put the, look into the telescope at one end. All of a sudden, the time is in front of you. All aspects of time when you look through, rather rather than a linear thing and. I think this is really also one of the great realizations of astral is that everything, as you say, everything you, you've experienced. I've also felt the same thing often with, because um, I've started doing courses um, and just workshops and, and, and teaching people uh, how to do this. And, uh, and and I knew that I would do this. So I would have like astral experiences of this experience or even the name of my book. I had an astral experience of the name of the book and, it's it, it's a funny thing, isn't it? It's, it's once again, as I said, it's like this mirror looking back on itself, on itself, on itself, on itself, and you you kind of just know that. Um, I guess an authentic, uh, an authentic life is really kind of surrendering in a good way, isn't it? But but I must say, early on, I felt I felt a little hijacked because I was in a musical career, I was a conductor and a violinist. Things weren't really going the way I wanted, though. Looking back. Um, and then when the astral experiences started, I found myself saying things um, or even certain situations just derating themselves that weren't optimal for, for that particular career. So I, I started becoming more authentic, if you like, but it appeared as though I was saying the wrong thing at the wrong time. But in fact, looking back, it was actually the right thing at the wrong time. But that <laughs> career those, that, that career ceased to exist. That took a nosedive. But it was at the time it, it, it was tricky, and I thought, well, you know, what is this experience? And then when I had a real, um, I was able to go back into my old life. I remember that it was about twelve years ago, and I had to make the choice. I can either I had a, a real offer. It was like it was kind of good. It was a conscious break with the past way of thinking, and I was given an offer either either to go back into that world of music, and I thought, well, you know, conductor. You really have to immerse yourself like anything. You know, there's a lot of score studying and there's a lot of stuff that comes with that. But I was so I was so uh, taken with this whole path I was on, the path of consciousness, and I just thought, what really fascinates me now? I thought, what is my real passion? And at that time, I thought, no, this astral travel thing it, that that's that's where I'm at, you know. And I was doing Reiki and energy, you know. And I just thought this whole world was just so fascinating. And there was like a conscious split with the past, and then. It was kind of good that that opportunity had come up once more, um, so I could um, 
really assess what it, what it is I wanted. So I felt then less of, I, I didn't feel I was so much a victim then because at that stage I thought, well, you know, you know, on a certain level, you know, damn, that's all trouble. Where, where's it taking me? What, what's going on? But, but then I really realized, no, 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 it's, it's not at all being a victim. It's, it's, it's kind of coming into alignment with a higher realized self and, and really just, just feeling a lot, lot, a lot more content and, and happier. So, um, I've no idea how that question started, Jesse. I have no idea if I answered <laughs> what we're talking about, but it doesn't matter. It's the same. Often, I think we were on authenticity in there and, and moving into we authentic lifestyle, but that's all good. And and yeah. actually, where you went is is great because uh, it's it's where I wanted to head next, anyways. Which is, I'm going to throw a couple of questions out at you all at once here, and and that is when somebody is doing this, do they need to be afraid of doing this? Are there precautions they need to take or things that they need to be aware of when traveling into the astral realm? That's a really good question, and this has been coming up a lot lately. Uh, I find with people, um, look, occasionally out there, like any adventuring, um, occasionally out there, um, it, it can be a little bit scary. It's like it's a little bit like a. I think of my little cat. The first time he he sort of went beyond the front fence, and the way he was looking at the world, it's just so. As you know, it's just so enormous. It's just this big feeling that you, you can be shocked, and often people. Um, I think they come back to their bodies with this, you know, you see people who have been unconsciously astral experiencing and they come back with this sort of like paralysis, sleep paralysis, because they're just sort of, they've obviously been shot by something. I think it's absolutely safe. I think that no harm will come to you. You need, you can work through things. For instance, myself, um, you know, often early on in particular, there were, uh, there were situations where little monsters would appear at the end of the bed and I'd, I'd tell them to nick off, whatever. But um, I even had one, one interesting experience that I must relate to you. I I felt myself pulled out of my body once again, and I thought this is great. You know, let's go. And then um, I, I felt a whack to my shoulder. I thought, what is this? And um, I also came came to again in bed, and I thought, well, this is interesting because I was still a bit sore. I felt a bit energy depleted. Now, this was going. This went on for quite some time. I came out again. I noticed there was. It sounds kind of unusual but if you look at all our myths and our fairy tales they all have a basis in in certain energies that are in our earth that are in our consciousness i found that there was a what would be best described as a witch hurling balls of energy at me so i mean there i am we're both hanging in the void kind of thing and she's hurling these energy balls at me and whacking me all around my body and i'm really that it was actually, me. <laughs> <I'm kidding. laughs> exactly who knows? Because in the end, it does come to a it does come to a um, to a conclusion. But anyway, I'm being whacked, and I'm sort of feeling that this is actually each night. This is actually um, taking energy from me. But I, I just only have to go through this now. Um, and she was like, why it showed itself as a she? I don't know. But she was very, 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 very ugly. Her skin was actually crawling. It was like it was made of maggots. It was like really quite her hair streaming and the stench. Uh, and it was. I thought well, this is just. But a part of me is thinking, already a part of me has started to detach and think, well, this is very interesting. What is this? What is this energy I'm coming up against with? Anyway, um, I, I, I discovered a way of also hurling energy balls to, to intercept her energy balls, but I couldn't actually make a direct hit. And this went on for quite a while. This is really fascinating. Nothing's being spoken. I don't seem to be going anywhere in the astral. This, this, this lasted for about a week. And um, eventually she said to me, Greg, she is my name. She said, Greg, and as often as you as you you can attest to, often in the astral, you know it's it's very real, as you say, and and beings often talk to you by now. And she said, "Greg, you're getting very good at the whole defending thing, aren't you?" I thought, "Okay." And then it kept on going the fight. And the next thing, she was right by me, her face right in front of mine, absolutely, utterly frightening, just this pure wave of fear. And then I, for for some inexplicable reason I felt this uh, arise within me of some kind of empathy and it came through my heart this kind of empathy for for whoever this being was and at that at that moment her face became transfigured and into absolute beauty she she just was a, just a, a radiant being as cliched as it sounds that's what happened and then she said to me you see Greg it's all the same and I had this 
phenomenal re- realization then as I as I as I came back to my body, um, this realization that that really what we perceive to be the dark or evil or fear is really our own light seen through is really the, the light seen through our own shadow. It's like we look through a layer of our own shadow and we see we're looking at the light but we are we are tricked into thinking that that's, that's a dark energy. And I, I sort of then began to realize that there was no such thing as evil, that that, that um, everything is an act of love. It may be through an ignorant, an ignorant idea of love or, or a hurt feeling of love. or um, But that was a tremendous release. And um, obviously, getting back to what you were saying, obviously within me, I was still holding on to, to remnants of fear or whatever. And, and, you know, you could say, oh, you know, that, that was a tough lesson. Well, it, it was an experience to help me, to help me grow through that. And, and I wasn't hurt by it. I grew through it. Um, had I not confronted that, um, I don't think I'd feel so detached or, 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 or as less reactive as I do. So... And there were some experiences. I don't know if you had these experiences early on. I mean, you've been astral traveling since you were a child, so maybe you probably went through these early. But there were sometimes these, you know, like, yeah, as I said, little monsters and things like this. But you kind of, you go through that. And I think that uh, the human being has certain fears in its energy field. And you will, if you're taking these fears into the astral, you, you may have to confront them. Um, and even the and even the earth energy field from, from humanity has, I've seen these, bands of, of fear around the earth and it's interesting those stories so I think um, these things can be a little scary but it's up it's up to whether you want to gain clarity and, and looking back I look back to myself as a child I remember um, early on thinking uh, because it was quite a tumultuous childhood I had and I had a, um, a father and a stepfather who were both uh, abusive in terms of um, violence and looking back then I even thought okay here comes the drama I remember as a little kid and I, th- I thought to myself um, really life is, is about a circle it's about going through all this and then gaining clarity again and I, I kind of knew that early on even though I had to experience the drama through what I went through but but all of this all of these experiences you're gaining clarity you know and, and I mean to, to release fear or, or, the, or the concept of evil is, is enormous particularly in a world that likes to play out the illusion of, of evil. So, I mean, um, there's nothing to fear. And as you said earlier in your introduction, you, you, you are guided. So I like to put white light around yourself, and these things is really good. I mean, when I go to the average supermarket or when I'm in, um, you know, in the middle of town, in the middle of the city, and there's a lot of energies going on, uh, you know, yeah, I, I'll put up white light. It's not being ultra-defensive. It's just that we have very... As you know, a lot, a lot of dense energies here, and, and then when I come back, I'll just think to myself, okay, I, I, I can feel that there's an energy, a, a little bit of energy around me that's not mine, that's not helping me, and I just command that, com- command that from the God being within me to, to lead me and and um, to be healed. So it's you learn how to, how to live with this, and um, <clears throat> there's there's nothing to fear from the astral experience. Well, and, and you bring up a good point is, you know, even like we are in waking life, things are going to be how we choose to see them. You know, we might, just like in our so-called waking life, feel like we're at the mercy of circumstances or different things. Uh, we could feel that in an astral travel journey, but in reality we have total control. And I know for me that's one of the things I always kind of have well, I do it very just automatically now, I think, yeah, when I go yeah. to bed, knowing that I have total control in yeah. whatever comes my way during it. Um, but there are great lessons to be learned on the astral plane, and it can sometimes feel a little less intense in some ways or more fun or different things like that, at least in my opinion, I've, I've found that. And... Definitely for me, putting up the the circle of white light around my body um, when I go at night, because I know as soon as I go out, I'm I'm going to be gone. So uh, 
the, I think that people have to find, too, sometimes their own tools for what's going to make them feel comfortable along the way. Um, for me, I've, I, I don't really fear it. Can I, have I come up against some things that seem very scary? Yes, but like you and the witch uh, story that you told, they turned out to be really great ways of communication that were having lessons for me to learn. Um, and, you know, even though at times they could have been a little scary to look at, I knew I was not restricted at all <laughs> in that lifetime, which is a parallel in and of itself, right, that we're really not as restricted as we make ourselves out to be in this earth. Now, I did have a, a question that came in from the chat room, Greg, um, that the person was asking, and I, I have an idea how you're probably going to answer this just knowing you, but I'm going to put it out there anyways for anybody else that might have the same question, and that is should we have an astral map for a traveling guide, and if so, how do we obtain that? Um, you know, so I think they're kind of asking, you know, is there a map, is there some sort of guide there when astral traveling and... Um, you know, like, mm -hmm. should you know where you're going? Like, for you, you mentioned at one point you wanted to know what it was like to experience death. So should you know where you're going before you go out? I I, I mean, in terms of map, I mean, I've, I've heard of such things. I think um, reg regards to intentions when I have to travel, like, I found it often I'll I'll set a, like like I'm going on a trip, you know, or if I want to go back and, and witness a certain event, um, or if I want to travel to some place, I will put that intention into my field before I go. But but I found about it's about, it's around fifty fifty. Often I'll go somewhere um, where I've intended, but a lot of the time now I let myself be taken. So I, I have more trust in guidance, um, as you probably do yourself. So I mean, to set up a map is a little bit like to preempt um, uh, what it is you're going to experience, which seems to um, go against the idea of how, how do you know what you want to experience before you experience I mean, for instance, the, the, the whole past life thing, I hadn't thought of past lives. So personally, um, I would never ask. I wouldn't have thought to see my own death. I mean, whether or not we're pioneers in this, because there are so few people who actually do it. Wouldn't you agree, Jesse? I mean, there's so few people <laughs> who actually... I, I, I mean, it's, it's, it's fantastic to talk to you on this subject because even... So that I just had my book published last year, mid, mid last year, I've still spoken to so few people who actually experience it. So it's just so so lovely to to meet someone who does do it. <laughs> it's so nice um, to have master, kindred spirit to talk with. <laughs> it, is, it is, isn't it? Um, um, the map thing. Oh, what's your view of that? Uh, I mean, I don't know. Well, you know, I I kind of look at it this way, and 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 it's kind of how I approach a lot of things, is that I think that, like many things, whether it's meditation or whether we're starting our day and we have an intent for the day, that is all fine and dandy. And, you know, and, and that's one approach to things. So, you know, maybe you're trying to find out something specific. You may or may not get shown it, but... Yes. Um, you know, I might intend my day to work out a certain way, but it may not work out that way because other things may come up that need my attention. Likewise, when you astral travel, you can put the intent out, and like you did with death, you may end up going through that experience or getting that information. But for me, as you mentioned way back at the beginning of the show, um, it's an adventure and it's a journey and life isn't necessarily in my opinion about a destination it's about the experience and it's mm -hmm. about the journey and it's about the adventure and what do you get out of that mm -hmm. so true yes and to me uh, it's much more totally fun agree. to just go and see where I end up <laughs> I see, and it, 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 I absolutely agree, and it's it's more in the, in the alignment with the idea that we are kind of not restrictive beings, that we are there is something infinite about us, and and is something uh, explosive in that way, and and it's interesting because 
it, it gets back to that feeling um, like often, as I said, when I've analyzed how I feel out there, once I was in the void and I was on the way to somewhere, but I was in the void uh, in, the, in the middle of the journey and, and I felt this um, tremendous om come through me, like an om, and it was like the, the Buddhist om, I guess, and it was this, it was this low resonating sound and I actually felt it permeate me and it was, I, I thought to myself, um, uh, wow, it's this, I, I think when we talk about, like scientists talk about that, that energy that is the, is the big bang and I like to think of it as more a creative ecstatic surge. This, this energy that, that we emanate from, that is going through all our cells at all time because we are all energy. We, we all must originate from the original energy, if you like. So this energy that permeates through us is like an ecstatic energy. And that, me to, to me, ecstatic energy really doesn't correlate to any kind of map, it, does it? It's, it's more a feeling of, of expansion and, um, and, and, yeah, as you say, adventure. You're sort of growing and, and, and realizing who you are and you're, you're taking on star consciousness and we're taking on cosmic consciousness and universal consciousness and we're just sort of it's such a, a lovely interplay of energies and and um so to restrict through a map yeah i, I would agree with you jesse and you know i i the person was following up with the question shouldn't that be for advanced travels being that uh you know just journeying and not being destinations focused, and what I'm seeing maybe in, you know, I don't know how it rings for this person or not that's asking these questions, but um, for somebody that's coming from that perspective, is that that need for a map comes back to whether you trust yourself or not. And I think if yeah. you trust yourself and your ability outside of your body, and that's not about how advanced you are. It's about trusting yourself. If you trust yourself, um, you realize you don't need a map. It's like, uh, you know, if you're going to take a trip across the U.S., uh, you don't always need a map. You maybe want to have a general idea where you're going, and when we're after traveling, that general idea is the universe. Our universe versus, you know, other universes, for, for example. <laughs> But it, it you know so the the You're general direction, right. yeah, yeah, and and I think that uh, yeah, it's it's not always. Uh, to me, my experience is 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 that uh, it is a lesson learning time. It is an information gathering time, and my soul self may have a map that I don't know about on my conscious level, but my conscious certainly doesn't. Yeah, and that's the crux of it, isn't it? Yeah, that that really is the crux. And as you say that this, these uh, messages, like the universe is full of messengers. And if we get back to your idea of, of um, lucidity and lucid dreams and the difference, what I found is that I, I agree with you totally on the idea uh, on the, on how lucid dreams and astral travels are very different. There's something not quite um, real about the, the lucid dream, but I found. In lucid dreams, you can really also there are transformative tools and there are messengers yeah. in them. Um, for instance, to, to actually get into the astral, I found that if there is often in a lucid dream there may be one particular thing I call those things the messengers. One particular thing that is, that is particularly real. Um, um, I remember once was a fascinating one. I was in a cave, and I thought, okay. And I was trying to work something out. You know, often in dreams, people are trying to work things out. I thought, and then I became lucid. I thought, okay, this is a dream. I don't have to work anything out. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so uh, <laughs> the tension drops. Awesome. It's good, isn't it? And I'm, in the, and I'm in this cave, and I notice I look around the cave and think, okay, this is a dream. It's not quite, you know, real, real. And I look around, and um, there's a certain boulder in the corner of the cave that looks very animated, if you like. And I know that, okay, there's energy there. And I, I focus on that boulder and I feel myself pulled through it, just like an astral pulling, boom, like a wind. And then all of a sudden, this is interesting, all of a sudden that cave became a room. So, and that was real. It was, I was in a, an astral realm. And that, that was a fascinating way of, and that's happened a few times. And that particular time I come through and um, there, there's, there are people there and, and, and this woman comes up to me and says, Greg, 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 can you help me? I said, what? what? And she says, well, 
said, um, you know, my husband is, is, is um, I'd like to bring to justice. He, he, he murdered me. And you know, all these people are queuing up. And next to me is my guide. I recognize a, a female who is, who has grown along in human years. This is fascinating since the, my first hospital experiences, but I, I recognize her as a guide. I look to her for advice, and she just sort of looks the other way. And I, I realize this woman is, is, is probably freshly passed away, and she's wanting me to help her bring someone. She's telling me the details of her death and things and where. And, uh, and I say, no, I, I, I think to myself, do I want to do this? And I don't want to do this. I don't want to, I, I don't want to intervene. That, that's my particular um, choice at that particular time and uh, you know you still have a choice of what to do I just didn't want to um, but the messenger in that dream was something like I, I, I could not have chosen to go to that realm and confront that particular thing plus it, it's it's kind of um, it works back on itself like the more acid experience you have the more lucid experience you have in dreams, and vice versa, perhaps. I don't know, because I've come more from an astral perspective first. But I've found that um, this messenger concept, like even in a... Um, uh, I had a dream uh, not long ago, and, and here was my stepfather in the dream, and even though we, you know, he, I love him now, he's, he's a lovely guy, and he's apologized for any, anything bad he did, but... But that's not the issue. There can still be remnants in your psyche. You know, there's always these things. And I had this dream, and I know I'm dreaming. And, uh, you know, I'm watching TV with a friend or whatever, and then my dad comes out of the room and says, the TV is very loud, and he's very angry. I'm thinking, okay, this is a dream, okay. Uh, and he's still coming to me, and I'm saying, well, actually, it's not that, you know. You learn to be, you probably found the same. You learn to be respectful of characters in dreams, lucid dreams and astral traveling. You really learn to be respectful, I find, over time. And, and I'm just talking to him calmly, saying, well, you know, it's okay, it's okay. Then he comes over to me, and then I found that what I found is in these situations, he's right near me, and I think, well, what do I do? I found that I become really, I don't know, there's just a feeling, of, once again, of kind of empathy, and I actually merged with him. It's interesting. And I find that um, the therapeutic tools of these lucid dreams, um, which have definitely gathered momentum since having astral awareness, it's phenomenal because uh, obviously there are remnants of, of of fear or whatever, but it's fascinating this idea that I actually sort of merged with him and I woke up feeling very good. I even found once uh, just before my book got published and maybe on a certain level I was concerned with how it would be received. It was a feeling of coming out if you like, you know, whatever you perceive as mad, you know, whatever. Anyway, which of course has not been the case, been absolutely the opposite. But anyway... Um, I've had, I'm having this amazing astral experience and then there's these two two beings behind me and they look like men or whatever and I'm about to I'm about to fly this beautiful astral lake just having fun and then these guy, one of them says oh you're having a samsara moment and and once again samsara isn't a word I necessarily use but I understand what he was saying they were kind of in many ways detractors of my experience where they represented that and I thought well I can easily fly away from them but I thought no don't and I found myself I allowed them to pull me in and kind of to destroy me, they kind of beat me and destroy me, but it wasn't painful. Once again, you learn that you can't die. And I even felt a beautiful wave of ecstasy once again after this. And on an intellectual level, one can't explain what is going on, but I just knew that to, in these situations, to be aware of who you are, what's going on, and, and to just sort of mold, mold into the situation or, or to let go, um, even though they could be seen as potentially threatening. There was no threat. It's a fascinating experience. And, and um, yeah, it's... Um, I don't know if you've had similar experiences, Jesse, but just this... It, it, it is a phenomenal expansion um, when, it, when it also seeps into uh, your, your dream world and your real world, where you learn that there is no fight. You learn... Mm -hmm. You learn that, um, as you say, you may plan your day, but um, it might not go that way, and, and that's okay. <laughs> it, it, that's all right, and, and, you, and you realize that, well, the energy, of, the energy of fight, for instance, can only perpetuate the energy of fight. Um, and, and, of course, we're all wanting to achieve that, that state of, of, of being pure love, but... It's not so much an intellectual state of pure love and reading. It's not so much that it's to, to do with feeling that um, there is nothing 
that you need to attain that is outside of yourself almost, and that because that in itself is a fight. If you if you wanting to attain, if you want something, for instance, I say to people um, who who want to know more about meditation, because I found meditation and relaxation very important for astral traveling, is that you don't try to meditate; you just meditate. So if you you sit down and and, and you know you relax your body parts. Um, because they're actually intelligent. You don't need to talk with them as though they're a little baby. You, your consciousness knows exactly what you're on about. So, And after a while, it, it honors you. And it's the same way life is. It's, it's like what you were saying before, when you when you go to sleep, you, 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 you know your power, and you know if there are things in your field that you don't want, then push them away if they're not you. You know, So you really do um, come into this fantastic sense of of power in a good way, you know. This really feeling that you are a, a um, oh, what's the word? You're you're a being of um, yeah, within your power. Um, and once you're again, empowered. I've gone way off. <laughs> yeah, you're empowered. I've probably gone way off topic. <laughs> Gee, it's but um, it's okay. You know, but you you kind of addressed too because I was going to say, you know, to to have you just touch briefly on how somebody goes about getting into this astral travel state. But I know that, you know, you do get into that in your book as well, Awakening the Giant um, Within, and that's a a personal adventure into the astral realm. Um, and, And you kind of brought up a good point, I think, in there, too, that so many people get, I think, and this is my observation, they get so worried about, am I doing it right? How do I do it? Where's the step-by-step book? And, um, you know, all of these technical aspects. And, you know, for me, I was taught, okay, you, you know, you do some breathing and you put some white light around you. And then, but the, but there is no exact way to explain how to separate from your body. It's something that you just kind of like ask to separate and kind of in a way visualize yourself over your body and that grows and it's experienced to where you feel it and you feel, yes, I'm looking down and I'm seeing my body. And it's like when people have out-of-body experiences, say, for example, to in an accident, they don't stop and go, oh, am I doing this right? It just happens. <laughs> yeah, so you're, you're so you're so right. That's such a good way of putting it too. That after a while you put the intention out and you visualize it, but after a while you you start to feel it, and that is the um, that is really when the whole thing transforms. And that's a difficult one to get across. I know with some some students who are learning, um, I, I do say one exercise too is to to lie on this uh, one side of your body and then to imagine turning over on the other side of your body, but don't actually do it. But after a while you'll actually feel your energy shift over onto the other side. So you start to, to turn in the, the astral body. And I say, yeah, I've been trying this, I've been trying it. And I say, well, don't, don't try it. <laughs> Just do it. Because every time you say, I try to do it, you, you actually externalize the process. You say that it's not of me. And that um, the point I try to make to people is that astral travel is within you. Uh, everybody has that capacity. It's actually one of our bodies. So it's just a sense that, is not given attention to be act- activated. So just like people who have read my book has just said through reading it, and, and, and even very right brain people. I, I know someone who's a lawyer, and he wrote to me and said, look, um, I'm not at all interested in this, but, I, but my wife gave me the book. I read it, and um, I had a, an astral experience um, after reading the book, and uh, I didn't try to do it. And um, and I thought that's interesting. So he read he read it, and therefore subconsciously he's taking certain things in because how many of us actually intend to leave our bodies so if you do this i think every night uh, for even a couple of weeks i think you'll get some results after that because most of us most people just aren't doing it um how can you have a perfect golf swing unless you actually swing a golf club well and i think i think in order to do this part of the process is you have to be able to relax. And yes. as I know you how you like how you got into meditation and why you started doing that for your work with music and for me, 
I used it to get past test anxiety in mm-hmm. school. And if we are so worried about how we're doing it, we're actually blocking ourselves from doing it. Because so we're true. creating a stress that is blocking our ability to relax and get out there. And so the key thing is really, I think, is practicing relaxing. And like you say, you have a great technique there of lay on one side of the body and feel yourself turn over without actually doing it. That's really a great, I think, um, way of kind of practicing that feeling. Mm-hmm. It is a nice one. And also, it's not too hard to do. And also, if if you keep doing it, as you kind of get sleepy, if you're in bed, you, you kind of lose uh, the logical mind kind of unravels and and, you, and it's easy to do. So at some stage, you will start to feel it. You know, um, even those who have had no experience, they'll start to feel that some kind of shift. I even try just on the weekend, because um, we're doing a workshop with some people, I thought, lying just flat on your back and kind of feeling yourself rocking side to side. And um, and you kind of, after a while, feel it, your own tempo of momentum. You can feel your body rocking slightly out side to side, an energy body. And just to to, to feel this, and it's kind of almost uh, hypnotic, or it's it's very relaxing process just to imagine it. And it also, um, as you say, to bypass the concept of trying to do it. Trying, trying is a block. And I think that... Um, a lot of people inadvertently use this idea of um, something, you know, to try to do something or what is the step you should take or to actually stall what it is they want to achieve. It's, it's, it's a, perhaps a subconscious block, but it's, it's inadvertent. Maybe they have certain fears for that experience. But I think um, when people start to realize, particularly in Western society, that astral traveling it really is safe. You, you won't die from it. You, you won't be taken over by some terrible entity. You know, it, it's not going to happen. And I think that when people really feel, perhaps feel safe with this, because we do live, better or for worse, we do live in a very material-focused society. And um, but but knowing that as spirits and um, you know we've we've lived before. We, we've many of us, many 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 of us. If you're on the spiritual path now. You've been on that spiritual path for other lifetimes, and and this is really um, it's accumulative, you know. So so the things you can do, you don't need to go to to a far off monastery somewhere and 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 um, and go into a lotus position for a year uh, without eating <laughs> to experience this. Wouldn't you agree? I think we we really can do it in this culture as long as we we really lose that fear. And realize that we're, we're, we're blocking ourselves, as you say, by by saying to try or where's the handbook or or you know that kind of thing. Mhm. Mhm. Well, it's just like a lot of things we we tend to try too hard, and then we don't tend to get there. And when we relax and, as you mentioned earlier, surrender to to the experience, then we tend to get to go where we were trying to go to <laughs> when we stop yeah. trying. Um, yeah. In that, so hey, Greg, I would love for you to share um, anything that you have coming up that people can participate in, your contact information, because I imagine you are maybe somebody who's available by Skype for certain things. Share where people can get your book. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, look, uh, my website is, is the best. This has everything on it. Um, I've been doing a lot of workshops lately and talks um, because I've recently come back to Australia. Really, I was living in Europe, so... Now I'm in Australia, but I'll be traveling around a little bit. My website, uh, 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 um, R-E-I, as you said before, K-I, uh, .com is the best way. And, and there I have everything on that. You can get my book through there, but you can also, there's a, a fair bit of information about the book on the website, but you can also, um, like in the States, you can you can get on any of the um, online stores or even you can order it in at, at your local store if you like. So, um, it should, it's easy there because it was published in, in the state, so it's easy to um, to get. And and one thing I'd say, many people have said that it, it it's not it's not a dif- it's not a difficult book to read. You'd probably agree with that, Jesse. It's it's, it's it reads uh, it's basically the story of what happened to me and how everything uh, progressed with the astral thing. And um, 
it does have information on also the exercises that I found have been useful in to to gain a little bit more control of the experience or and um yeah, so all the information is, is there really, and I'm developing workshops now, and it's been an intense time lately, so it's soon we have a summer break here, which um <laughs> um you guys is a bit further off, so things are, are, are quietening down now, which is nicely, <laughs> which is nice. But um, but uh, yeah, everything's on the website there. So um, um, yeah, yeah. And and I'll get your book also posted on my website. I have a tab for um, various guests that I've had on the show, and and it will go into that realm of stuff too, where people can can link into your um, Amazon.com mm-hmm. page for the yep. book and order that way. Um, oh, brilliant. So, you know, that I should be able to get that up, uh, I don't know, sometime in the next week, um, that mm-hmm. it'll get added in there with that. And look, uh, and look uh, sorry, I've got to say it's mm-hmm. tremendous because to get feedback, um, as you know yourself, it, it's just, it's, it's a great feeling when you get people... Um, all around the world who, uh, yeah, who I, I guess now with internet it, it is the fantastic thing. Hey, we really do feel more and more connected, but it's it's amazing the feedback to this subject. Um, I, I, I really hadn't imagined that. For me, the the incentive to write the book was a feeling of, I did want to get it off my chest, but I wanted to share with people, but but I, but um, it's such a, it's such a lovely thing to share this and, and get this, um, you know, connection. As, as I've, I've, I've met you through this whole experience as well, um, it's, 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 it's just a wonderful process. It It is, and I think that using our own personal stories, as you did with this, is really important because it, it helps other people relate to the experience. And, mm. you know, your sharing of things uh, through this book I think is really a great way for people to connect, and I think it's a great way for them to grab some of the tools and things that you've mentioned in the book um, to help them with their own experiences of exploring this and understanding it better. And I, I think that that's the key. I think it's just one of those things that, you know, uh, it is about learning how to understand it better, and yet you're not going to get the solid concrete explanations with this like you're going to with certain other things. When we start to delve into some of these soul things, the explanations simply just aren't as concrete as, for example, how to assemble a desk. <laughs> so true. <laughs> so true. You know, you know, on that on that particular subject, it was interesting. I, I was holding a talk here in Brisbane just a couple of nights ago, and, and there was a doctor in the audience, and um, she said to me, she she said there was... It was interesting. She she was very open. She said there's no. She's never heard of such a thing, and um, she said she, this experience is not scientifically um, validated. Not in a negative way. She just said it, it. And she asked me if I'd take any anything, and I said, well, no, I've never, never smoked anything. I, I I don't drink coffee. I can't drink coffee anymore because I, I react to it too strongly. And um, and then someone else in the audience who was from Indonesia said. Oh, this is a ridiculous question because in Indonesia we've been brought up with these stories all our lives. We know that people astral travel. It's not a question, and and it was it was fascinating, <laughs> and, and it was it, it it wasn't um you know a volatile uh, conversation, but it was interesting then to hear yeah just this 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 Indonesian guy say this is absolutely normal. What he's talking about is is documented, and yeah. um you know by our doctors, and um and, and there's actually a huge study going on at my old uh, college alma mater. Cal State University Northridge uh, in, I think it's the psychology department, it's been going on for about three years that specifically focuses on this. Yeah, yeah, interesting, isn't it? I mean, I think, like, I deliberately, as I said, I wasn't on a spiritual quest consciously, and I deliberately stayed away, particularly through a lot of these experiences, I stayed away from from, um, any literature on the subject for a while, because like to hear the oh, I'm, I'm not a Buddhist. I was never a Buddhist, but to hear the Om uh, resonate through me, to to feel that that the fat little Buddha. Now I've got him on my table, but to feel him in my tummy early on, 
um, to even experience, I had once a Native American initiation ceremony on, on a frozen lake in the astral, and it was just fan- it was just so beautiful. Yes. Um, and like, I, these weren't themes in my life, but, but they're real. They're not things I'm reading. They're not things I'm experiencing them, you know, and, and it's just, it's mind-blowing really, isn't it? I mean, it, <laughs> wow. It, it is an incredible universe out there. <laughs> Yeah, we are winding down here, um, but I, I tremendously want to thank you for your time because I know it, it was semi-early, not not like 4 a.m. early, but semi-early oh. for you in Australia. And, you know, we could probably just keep going for another many hours <laughs> <laughs> on yeah. your, if we had the, the time uh, available, but... I want to take a moment to just really appreciate you for giving us your time and remind everybody that, again, you can check out Greg's work at gregdoylereke.com, and his book is, uh, you can connect to it through his website. I'm going to get it up on my website as well, called Awakening the Giant Within, a Personal Adventure into the Astral Realm. And, Greg, it's just been an absolute pleasure to have you here. And thank you, and likewise, it's been it's been wonderful. I've really enjoyed it, Jesse. So thank you for the invitation. Thank you. Absolutely. And next week on the show, we will be looking at the masks that we wear and the roles that we play. So it's going to be really interesting for a Halloween show. And I'm going to be on early, earlier in the day, earlier in the morning next week, uh, because it is Halloween. And as those of you know, I'm trying out some different time slots to see what uh, really resonates and, and what kind of response I get in different time slots. Now that I'm on the road full time, I'm, I'm making some of those adjustments. Go ahead, check out the events I have coming up. Uh, still a couple hours left to register for the event tomorrow in Media PA at Ridley Creek Street State Park. Uh, some other great events coming up in Atlantic City next week, Washington, D.C. the week after that, Atlanta, Georgia after that, and then on into San Antonio, Texas. So there's still a lot to take advantage of on the Compassion Tour. Uh, you'll also find my monthly special on my website. There's still another week to take advantage of that, which is if you register for any full one- or two-day weekend event, you can receive all four of my ebooks absolutely free. And I do have some hard copies that will be available while they last, if you prefer those. We do have several shows here on Main Street Universe throughout the week. Sunday nights, we have Darren Bucare, who's a reader at Madame Laveau in New Orleans, doing Spiritual Insights. Monday nights is Randy Goldberg doing Vedic Astrology. Tuesdays is Susan Weed, who is sharing her work in herbs and natural plants. Wednesday nights, we have Daniel Denise. Uh, they're running our flagship show, sometimes readings, sometimes guests, sometimes topics. They have a lot of different things. Janice is actually going to be getting her own little segment of uh, things going on on our network. Uh, Kevin Baird pops in with his uh, Walking on the Sidewalk with his Horizon Oracles Journeys deck, a deck he created. You can check that out at templeofgaia.com. And, of course, Fridays here is Activating Compassion in the Midnight Hour. Hey, this is Jesse Ann Nichols-George. I want to thank you so much for being here tonight. And again, thank you to all of our listeners, not only on Blog Talk Radio, but those streaming live on Penn, known as Pair Encounters Network, Dreamfinder, and Talk Stream Live, as well as those catching our podcast at iTunes and TuneIn.com, and those catching the YouTube version of the show. I look forward to seeing you back here next week as we delve more into activating compassion. Don't forget that if you've enjoyed the uh, show this evening, make certain that you share it with others. It's going to be available at this same link in our archives. And I'm going to go ahead and leave you with that song, Yearning For, also known as Over and Over. It's by Shemshai. And do check out Shemshai's work. They've got some great things. They offer up some free downloads. They're on Facebook. And their website is www.shemshai.com. And that's S-H-I-M-S-H-A-I.com. Thank you so much, and I look forward to seeing you again next week right here on Activating Compassion in the Midnight Hour. May you enjoy the rest of your weekend and have an absolutely amazing week. And if I could see what makes me blind I would soar to the edge of my mind And to touch what seems unreal Just to show you the way that I feel 